Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show, where we basically bring you all kinds of interesting ideas on how to generate cash flow, what to do with cash flow, how to invest your money to get more cash flow, all those kind of things. And today we have a special guest. I just found out he is outside of Vancouver and a huge property. It's Dustin Service. And I don't know if I said the last name right, Dustin. You got it right, Axel. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to the show and tell us a little bit, how did you end up in the investment world and service wealth as a company and your team and so forth? Sure, Axel. Thanks for having me on the show. This is exciting. You're far away from me. And so it's very cool that we get to connect like this. But my story is probably like most people went to university, tried that out. You know, I was going to get a science degree and failed, you know, basically three classes, English, math, and I was very consumed with the gym. And so that was more important than having three bagels on my drive to the university and, and getting uh, into the weights. But I did take civil engineering is what I actually took and got a diploma on that, which was a function of what could I take the, the, the shortest amount of school and make the most money. So in the oil fields, you know, 20 some years ago in Alberta, Canada, that was where you could take that profession and work lots of overtime and make money. But in that uh, journey, I found myself at a desk and I was able to uh, start trading stocks. So we had double monitors. So on one screen, I would be doing my work. On the other screen, I would be you know trading stocks. And you know the, the longer story is I walked into a bank at 20 years old and said, and this is just shows the credit situation back in the day, at 20 years old, and this would have been 2003 after the tech crash and said, hey, you know, I make uh, reasonable money. I'd like a line of credit, 50,000. And they said, no problem. 20 year old kid, line of credit, interest only, no collateral. <laughs> and so I said, I'm I'm going to use it to trade stocks and they said oh perfect <laughs> and <Really>? so <laughs> and she just shows now how naive it was and thankfully i didn't uh, lose my shirt but my philosophy was quite simple i had a savings account and i would look at you know if i made a fifty thousand dollar trade on you know jones soda was one of my first stocks or you know pfizer or whatever then if it went to zero and i lost everything to zero how many months of payments at interest only was did I have in savings to basically float that line of credit. And my thought was, well, I will go get an oil rig job drilling or, you know, working in camps and I'll just pay off the line of credit. So that was sort of my quick analysis of is the risk worth it? And so, you know, again, we'd be in, in a trade or I'd be in a trade for uh, a couple hours to a couple of days and just try and make a few cents on a bigger amount of money. Thankfully, I I did lose uh, lots of money, but I made more than I lost. And so I thought, you know, I like, I like this world. And uh, some of the people around the office started asking, hey, can you help us pick our funds in our group, you know, benefit RSP plan? And, and so we did. And again, it was more the timing. The, you know, the tide was rising after the tech crash, you know, all the way up to 05. I left the oil and gas world and said, you know, I'm going to take a run at, you know, being a financial advisor. And, you know, my first year was an eye opener, you know, in the oil patch at 23, I was making almost six figures. I made 15,000 my first year in the financial planning world. And really it was, it was an eye opener. And it was, you know, why would someone with investments and hard work and one of my clients calls it his made money? What the hell are you going to do with my made money? Meaning he's already made it and he's now giving it to you and so you're going to do something with it there's uh, a lot of trust involved in this world so fast forward you know i've been in the business almost 18 years and so you know we do our best work with clients of 2 to 20 million net worth who are looking for someone to be their general contractor or be their you know leader between the accountant the attorney you know their investment people their insurance people they want a, an intermediary that knows and understands that and so that's what we're up to now okay yeah that's very cool and let's go back to that statement that you just made even though you said it was originally kind of part of also your own world and work but if somebody came today and i mean there's one thing i should probably also bring up for you to explain it a little bit net worth is sometimes i think slightly misunderstood by people so if you could first quickly say how you not by the number but what it really means define from the asset kind of like composition or portfolio yeah. and then the other part is how would you nowadays after 18 years say if somebody came to you and say okay what are you going to do with my made money how, how would you go about it Sure. So the first question of net worth, usually when people say I need to make more or they're saying to themselves, I need to make more, I need to invest, I need to learn about this, I need to you know, build up, I need to buy real estate, I need to have a bigger portfolio of real estate, bigger okay. assets, you know, some friends in my group that, you know, they have a number, you know, it's, I need a net worth of 44 million or I need net worth of whatever. And what 
they're actually equating that to is a bigger the number, the more secure they feel and the more income they would have. So, you know, listener of, of Axel's podcast, income is a big thing. We need income to live. If you had zero assets and 400,000 of income for the rest of your life, most people would say, well, I'd sign up for that. You know, so it's, there can be a misnomer of like, you know, if you really know, we use a term called BAM, so bare ass minimum. And this is the, <laughs> the minimum expenses that exist for you to be around. So this isn't the Louis Vuitton or the travel. This is your mortgage payment, your car payment, your the groceries, you know, kids sports if you got kids in sport you know the basics you can even take the kids sports out and say that that's not a necessity but when you look at okay well you know a common person can probably live decent on five or six thousand a month you know maybe not maybe it's seven but really you know again i've done this for a long time a lot of my clients who are a couple they don't spend more than ten thousand a month you no, know so absolutely. and i mean you have fundamentally right like right now and i'm a little more familiar with the u.s numbers the medium income in the US is somewhere in the 62 to 65,000. And this is for like two adults going to work, right? That's now obviously there are people who are way, way more than that. But there's also a pretty substantial number of people who make way less, who make minimum wage, which to me is still crazy, is $7.25 in the United States. Right. And you, if you need like, that's like 16, <laughs> you need, like as a couple, you need six jobs to make it right. But if you think about that, so 62,000 is basically right around 5,000 a month, right? And yeah. So that, that would mean like you basically are yeah, gross. And that would mean you're kind of like in the medium level. The reason I asked you to touch on that a little bit is one of the things that I know for myself, and we talked a little bit about what I'm up to right now on the family side, but it's also true for our clients. And I'm sure for quite a few of our listeners that there is this term high net worth individual and what i'm always pointing out that is different than a high asset value individual because mm -hmm. as i'm preaching that we want to do our investments using leverage which in real estate you can obviously do i can have like you just said a 10 million dollar portfolio in asset value but only put literally 2 million over time of my own money in it and i shouldn't say only but only one fifth of that would be basically my own money. And it would be basically in a way stuck unless I do home equity lines of credit or stuff like that. Now, a high net worth individual and everybody has a different number, but that really goes to how much actual, for lack of a better term, cash or money in your checking account can you give to Dustin to make more out of it, right? So mm -hmm. if I say, okay, I have a three or $4 million real estate for you, that doesn't really help you to do something with it because it's in the properties. Whereas mm -hmm. somebody who comes and says, okay, you know, I have 2 million high net worth in, you said, savings account or checking account or brokerage account. Now, what do you do to make it work and do more, right? Coming back to that question, I think it's important to have that distinction when we talk about these high net worth investments, that the money is literally money that is available to invest. Yeah. And for, for someone who's not, you know, listener, if you're not you know, considered high net worth. And that, that's a very vague term. But at the same time, you know, just what Axel said, if you had a million dollar property that was almost paid off or say it was, you know, eight years left, and you were close to retirement, you could, and again, you know, Axel, maybe you could beat me up if this is a wrong mentality. But if you said, hey, I'm really looking forward to the next 10 years, I'm 60 years old, I'm able bodied, I'm going to spend more from 60 to 70 than I am from 70 on, you could refinance that property from an eight year amortization back to 25. Again, it's, yeah, you're going to pay a lot more interest, but all of a sudden the cash flow, if you were sort of neutral, rent comes in, pays off basically my bills and that's it. Well, all of a sudden you're going to have extra cash a month. So your net worth actually might go down a bit, but to your point, you might have a lower net worth, but if your cash flow is high, that's what you need to live on. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, so, you know, if you take this scenario and I would say, okay, one of my clients were in that situation and they just want to bump up at least from an opportunistic point of view for that 10 year window that you just mentioned between 60 and 70, go out crazy traveling, see the world, do all the, the good stuff. And we would say, okay, well, let's take a home equity line of credit. You don't really get rid of the asset you keep the asset now here's 500,000 go to Dustin and we would want to obviously know that you have 18 years experience to make sure that it is only going up and not going down so now here we are and say, <laughs> okay we took the line of credit you have a few years to make it more so we can give the 500 back or however much that we took and then have a good amount of money left so we can go and have some fun for a while. Yeah. I think that you did ask me a thing and I, I will sort of color that because you know, 
you do investments and investments is a silo, a wedge, a whatever you want to call it that we use in our plans. I think real estate is a great tool for many different reasons. We do try to, you know, I always say if you want to, you know, grow your wealth, concentrate. If you want to protect your wealth, diversify. So as people are younger, go all in on real estate, do a development, you know, do something long term. But as you get to, you know, 60 years old, you're saying, I don't, you know, I got all this money in real estate. What would you do with a million dollars? And again, most of our clients tend to be business minded, business owner. We try and take the stock market charts and the demystification of like, what is that? You know, people go, the market's up, market's down. It's like, but people don't really know what they're at. they're saying. It's just they see it on the news. And so if you think of, you know, buying a stock or an investment, if you are a business owner, you run your business very simply. You try and generate revenue. You try and sell something to somebody or offer a service. You've got expenses that require, you know, you're, you're required to pay to keep the business going. So you cut expenses. What's left over is your excess cash. You take that excess cash and you choose I'm going to reinvest all the money back into the business, or I'm going to take a dividend and I'm going to take a little dividend. So I'm going to take a dividend and I'm going to reinvest some back. If you think of a, a you know, I'll use again, this isn't a buy or sell recommendation, but I got to use an example. Say Wells Fargo Bank, Wells Fargo or JP Morgan or, you know, a food company, you fill in the blank of the company Goodyear tires. They make sell tires. They have expenses at the end of the year. They've got excess cash. They choose to then dividend their shareholders. So give you some income and reinvest some of the money. To take all those stock charts you see on the news and kind of bring it back to an analogy you might think of, think of real estate. Think of a rental home. You buy it, you collect rent from your tenant, and you either invest a little bit back into the property and you take a little bit of income. That's your dividend. So once, you know, a lot of clients have an aha when you start connecting the dots of like, okay, real estate stocks, it is different. You don't get to drive by a stock and, and touch it. You could drive by head office for a business, but you also don't have tenants. There's some give and take of if yeah. you can find, you know, investments that you understand, that usually is what saves you money. It's not necessarily a bad investment where people lose money. It's behavior of not understanding or the business or the investment wasn't in their circle of competence. Yeah, absolutely. And I am a big fan of having, you know, a certain diversification with an emphasis area. Obviously, in our case, the emphasis area is on residential real estate. But I have a few things that I wanted to ask you because it's a rare treat for myself, but also on behalf of our listeners about these what's more traditionally considered investments or stock market and stuff like that because i mean fundamentally i know that if i came and say okay i, w I really like microsoft or goodyear or any of those companies you Wells Fargo that you mentioned okay i give you ten thousand dollars but you have to get the other forty thousand so that you can buy fifty thousand dollars worth of stock that is not typically how stock investing works right yeah. so you have to basically have the money to make the investment but i'm just mentioning this as kind of like setting the foundation what I really wanted to try to get from an expert like you is how people like myself who have decided, okay, I'm mainly focusing on real estate, but I'm interested in certain fields, or you might say technologies. And because of that interest in those technologies, I like to invest into it. Like one, give you an example, the one pretty much the almost only stock I have in any numbers is Tesla, right? And so I do a lot of research and figure out what's actually um, going on with the company and how they're performing, how close are they keeping to their promises. You know, like Elon always says, I over promise and I'm late, but I keep my promises. <laughs> they're just late. So, you know, I can live with being late because for me, it's like real estate a long time investment. But what I'm not understanding, and I'm sure when you said, you know, people hear about the market is up or the market is down, the same is true for the stock is up or stock is down when you yep. either with your help or by yourself invest in something. Where does this oftentimes amazing disconnect between what the company is doing and reporting and the value of the stock come from? <laughs> Well, it's a big question. My first thought that comes is the market is full of emotion. And, you know, there's theories out there that the market is efficient, that it, the price of things is so efficient that it's pricing in whether people are optimistic or pessimistic. There's an economic confidence model that's designed by a certain guy. And he, like him or not, his name's Martin Armstrong. He's a bit of a 
interesting dude. But uh, you can find all sorts of good and bad on him on the internet. But he wrote this thing a long time ago called the Economic Confidence Model. And it is one thing that I do use because it is not so much the model and what he says happens, but if you look at the investment market and the psyche of people and consumer behavior, it is pretty spot on of people are optimistic, people are pessimistic based on certain things. So when they're pessimistic, based on world events, you get a bear market or you get a down sort of push. And when they're optimistic and there's a lot of quietness in sort of geopolitical and all that stuff, you get sort of a movement up. So that, you know, to tie that back to your question, does have a lot to do with sort of people's psyche. So that's the the base of the framework. Then you've got, i use your example of Tesla. You have... <laughs> And cult-like is not right for Tesla, but it is a movement. There is a movement around that technology, around Elon, around P- crypto. Crypto is a great example. It is basically stocks and Tesla, but compressed. So the cycles are very compressed because a lot of it has to do with social media and the social media sort of momentum that's put on certain things. So when there's a big push on, you know, Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and crypto things, there usually is a corresponding wave of activity in the social scene. And that gets a bunch of movement. Then there's some sort of crushing blow from the government that they're going to ban or whatever. And then, you know, it is the reverse. So, you know, back to your question of, you know, the value of a business, if you're going to look at sort of safer invest, Tesla's a bad example. Again, they're marginally profitable, but, you know, they are a real thing. That is, a you know, growth stock and value stock were the two kind of camps and value stock was always touted that, you know, it can outlast. I think growth is here to stay. I'd be more value by nature based on the dividends. If you go to dividends, I think that is a little bit more of a very traditional uh, view of things. I mean, (laughs) I had to chuckle a little bit because if you look at the biggest car companies in the world right now, right, and and I know that... What are you looking at right now? GM? No, well, you could look GM or Ford or Volkswagen or Toyota or stuff. And I know that any Tesla fanboy would say that you're wrong if you call them a car company, but I know that they are always put into the car company field and the analysts are looking at it that way. The point is when you say marginally profitable, they're about three to four times as profitable as any of the others. And they have no debt. They have $20 billion in, in assets sitting in the bank, basically in CDs and treasury bonds. But that's my point is more in general, even if you forget Tesla for a moment, and they have a probably the largest retail investor community and that whole social emotional stuff. If I'm looking and I prepared a little bit and I really hope that if I did something wrong or found something wrong, you sent me straight. But it looks to me that in stock market investing, in the stocks that are actually traded on the major exchanges, the percentage of what's called retail investors, people like you and me, is typically between zero and 15%. And 15% is way up there. That might, I think Tesla is like 12% or something like that. So let's just say it would be between zero and 10. That means 90% is supposedly people who know what they're doing, institutional investors, banks, pension plans, 401k plans, mutual funds, all that kind of stuff. So are they really that emotional? Or are they just having all kinds of algorithms running that stuff regardless? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, it, you know, there is, you got humans involved. So unless we're full automation, <laughs> then... You can name uh, them. You can name these humans are called analysts. <laughs> <laughs> well, so he, here's, I, again, when I brought the crypto, it made me think of something. So I have a friend who's a big Bitcoin person. And yeah. he says, you know, Bitcoin's the number one performing thing and blah, blah, blah. Well, I got Tesla up on my screen. So if you bought Tesla in November 2021, it was 407 USD a share. It's now 168 today. So for that person that bought that day, it's not a very good investment. For the person that bought in 2014, the price was 10 bucks. So that person is, you know, but it went as high as 407 and then went down. They've stuck it out. So the point that I do like to make when I talk about, you know, the circle of competence, when you invest in something, a person does need to have a keen interest in either what the company is doing, the people involved, the technology, the product, or they use it on a regular basis and know how freaking good it is. Because that, that is what will actually keep you 
invested through you know if if you went from you know from 10 bucks to 407 and didn't sell and now it's 168 like what is that person's psyche that person already thought they were going to retire or their wife was like wow high five good job you know now they're like well you've just lost a half you're more than half down like why didn't you sell it's like well i'm not selling because it's going to be way higher than 168. yeah but, but i mean well i shouldn't say but i think the answer to that question honestly at least on the retail investor side and I think you used the right word, or at least in the same frame, you call it maybe kind of akin or somewhat similar to a cult in some cases. At least I think on the retail side, I think there is maybe slightly less negatively connotated term is more like a fan kind of behavior, yep. which I find much more, and I'm falling into that category, but it's also very similar to, in a sense, doing the real estate investing. And that is kind of a form of dollar cost averaging, right? Where you say, okay, well, I believe in something, not in a religious sense, but in a technological or growth sense, if you want to go that way. And instead of trading, I can say, okay, because I believe this and I'm keeping up with a few, not like a huge portfolio of hundreds of, of investments, but Bingo. I, I have two, right? Like, so I'm, I'm, fully transparent. Everybody who knows me knows I only have Palantir and Tesla and that's it. But I'm also, I believe, very well informed about these two companies, not as good as real estate, but, you know, for stocks for me, somebody like me <laughs> having these two yep. stocks. And so as long as everything that I'm expecting them to do and what they're reporting as publicly traded companies on a quarterly basis, plus any other stuff that is being published officially, I'm not talking about a tweet from Elon or, or from the CEO of Palantir, uh, you know, that he finally got a haircut or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know, if you go and look at CEO for Palantir, you can see the guy needs a haircut, just like okay. I do. You know, it's a but in any case, you know, substantial stuff like what I would consider as substantial is, for example, Tesla's master plan 3.0, a 45 page document that goes into excruciating debt, how they want to become basically the company they always said they want to be right? that kind of stuff. And there's tons of other stuff. Arc Invest has done some re really interesting research papers on that from a different perspective. So, you know, being informed versus saying, OK, I'm reading trends, I'm reading, you know, some sort of you know Fibonacci curse or, or stuff like that. So I would say this is more in a little bit of the dollar cost averaging with the conviction that if they keep performing, then it is reasonable to say, okay, it goes up and down, but ultimately the value, and this comes, this gives you a little bit of a taste why I asked the question in the beginning and, and you gave great answers already, is how is sometimes disparity between what I would say the value of the company versus the actual stock price of the company. Because if you were to go and say, what did they actually do between, like you said, January 21 and today, that would mean that they should have lost more than half the value. If you look at yeah. everything that has been done, everything they have produced, every increase in incrementally in production, in, in paying down their debt, they have basically no debt anymore. All of those things you would say, wow, if any company, forget the name, forget the Elon thing, forget the cult stuff and say, I just look at the performance data of this company, you would say there's no chance this company could be worth half of what it was two years ago based on all the numbers that are available to us. Yeah, and I, same thing is true, like if you then compare in the same industry and say, how about your, um, GM for Toyota? They have basically done nothing, right? They've just been puttering along. Their performance has gone down quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. So for me, at the end of the day, I'm saying I'm still convinced because I'm a technologist who is convinced about their trajectory. And I can say this because I only need to study too. <laughs> but <laughs> it doesn't explain how this is physically possible and why we could have people if they're not as committed right like as into whichever company name you throw in that they could basically still be okay with it because as, as to me i hope you can say well here are some reasons why this happens and, and why this is okay to happen Think about a house. So you live in a house and once a month, your neighbor peeks his head over the fence and says, looks at your yard. I'll give you 500,000 for your house. 
and and you hadn't mowed the lawn that week, you know, or or whatever, you know, and it's like, and uh, then the next week, you know, he's feeling good. He just had a couple beers, screams over at you. I'll give you five twenty five. You know, the next month he's got a cold. Give you four seventy. You know, like that is the same. That is the same. There's in a market in the stock market or Tesla. There's people buying it. And there's people selling it. And when you're again, you whether you know if you want to show me proof that algorithms run the whole market and there's no humans. Oh no, then... I'm not. I'm not saying this. <laughs> I, I can only provide, and it's not really that we're fighting over it. It's just a fact that, and I think you would agree that somewhere between zero and 15 percent is retail the rest is institutional yeah right? so the institutional side always claims to be full of experts i give them that but the results and and tesla is just an extreme example there are plenty of other examples right like i mean you could say how could amazon have the valuation that it had before it was profitable right if you go back at the charts and look at amazon how their share value has increased pretty consistently even though for a decade they were not profitable and i've always been saying i think the model can work but nobody can explain to me why the stock price keeps rising it just makes well, sense so if you think about the market being dominated i agree with you by institutions so you call those the pros and you call the you and me's the privates so you got the pros and the more privates. pro than i <laughs> <laughs> well it, realistically though you know i have investment teams i don't actually in 2017 i have all the designations i've changed my business model so i actually have teams of people that make all the buy sell decisions so right, they right. should probably be commenting on some of these things but if you think of like the pros and the privates when the privates the you and i's when that becomes a little bit bigger so there's a bigger percentage of those people making trades the market is either going to move pro like on the upside is going to move up when you've got people whose mortgage payments are going up and all of a sudden they're you know they got crushed in 2021 or 2022 and so the market they're not doing well they're not going to cocktail parties where people are saying oh i got 18 percent you know i bought tesla and it went up 100 percent <laughs> that isn't happening because the market's just sort of been bleh along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They stopped doing it. And they start, you know, a couple of years goes by and, and your spouse says, hey, you know, I think we should really reno the house. No, no, I got these investments. Like, well, how well have they done? Well, they've done nothing. They've actually gone down. Sell it. And so now the, you know, the the private or the pros, it, it becomes a bigger influence. So now you're going to have bigger sway into it. So I can't explain Tesla why it's, you know, if the only reason I could think of is that it was overvalued to start with. It got too high ahead of its feet. And so now it's where it should be. It felt like it was, it should have been there. And again, you, I'm not a Tesla, you know, I haven't analyzed it. So you, uh, yeah, I'll take your well, I can give it. you my explanation and then we move on to uh, back to the question. What would you <laughs> Yeah. This has been fun though, Axel. Yeah, no, no, I know. My explanation <laughs> is there are now multiple companies around the world, but you know, even especially in the in the US, in my kind of like investor horizon timeline for let's say the last 20 years, or you said 18 years, that don't in general don't fit into the traditional categorization that we used to see, right? Like mm -hmm. people, I would say the vast majority of the analysts for Tesla are automobile industry analysts. The vast vast majority of people at Amazon are retail industry analysts. And if you look, or you could do the same thing for Facebook, for Google, for, you know, that there are software people that looking at Google, even though Google is making almost all of its money in marketing and advertising. There are people that look at Amazon as a retail organization, even though the vast majority of their money comes from AWS, right? And so forth and so forth. So, and Tesla is the same thing. Tesla is now growing it extreme amounts, unheard of amounts in energy, right? But the analysts that actually supposedly are supp to follow the stock, do estimates, you know, Bloomberg estimates and all these estimates are auto analysts, right? And they say, okay, if the company doesn't make 30 or 40% more cars than last year, then there is something wrong with them. They have a demand issue or and some kind of bullshit like that. Right. And yeah. so there's more and more of these organizations that have gotten successful by not being single lane, or you could say kind of single minded on just one thing where the vision and this is actually in for me, the interesting thing is it used to be at least when I studied a little bit in economics that you wanted to go and say, what is the company intending to accomplish? Or you could call it what's the vision state? Mm -hmm. Like, and then you come across certain things like Steve Jobs once said, you know, I want to put a ding in the universe. And you had to interpret what, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> <And a ding laughs> in the 
But the same thing is true with Apple, right? Like they started out as a computer company, then they became a phone company, then they became an entertainment company. Now some people rumor they might also come up with a car. It's the same thing, right? Like so these really, really successful and relatively highly valued company don't fit into a narrow lane or narrow box of where the analysts live. And I would go as far because I'm a real estate guy to say most of the analysts in the auto industry don't understand Tesla. Most in the analysts in the retail industry don't understand Amazon. Most people in the software analyst camp don't understand Google or Facebook. You know, when Mark Zuckerberg said, okay, I want to emphasize Meta, that was like, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> completely, you know, nobody could explain what that even means, right? So at least not in the analyst community. So yeah. that kind of stuff, which basically tells me and, and brings me back to the question that you kind of triggered initially. If somebody comes to you and says, Dustin, okay, I have a good chunk. I don't think it needs to be somebody is in due time or short time going into retirement, but just somebody who for whatever sold a business or made a good deal or sold a property, real estate or something and says, okay, so I have a half a million dollars. I don't have time to figure out how to do this. Dustin, you you guys are the experts. How can you make more out of that? What, what would you try to do or what would you tell them? Sure. Without giving specific stock sort of comments, I would say I'd break it into what we call an asset dedication model. So a million dollars. So they got a million dollars and I would say, what's your BAM? And they would say, okay, well, I spend, you know, a hundred grand a year. Let's just use that. So we'd put a hundred grand. We put 300 grand into GICs or as high interest vehicle as we could get. So a one year, two year, three year. And then we would take the rest of it and then we would, you know, have a risk conversation. And so that might be 400,000 that they say, you know, I, I really like real estate and we want to, you know, we're going to try and shoot for a 6% return. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, can we get a 6% return? We'll buy a piece of real estate with cash. Maybe we will source out an investment manager who does lending. So there's not a lot of huge upside, but they will say, Hey, you know, we do mortgages and we don't lend on houses that don't have 50% equity. And these would be, you know, a common example I would use is like, um, divorced family, business owner, one spouse, non-working other spouse, and the non-working spouse wants to stay in the family home. Non-working spouse can't get a mortgage because they haven't had income for a while, but then they'll underwrite the business owner who's the worker or, or generating the money who's going to be making these support payments. And they'll say, okay, for two years, the spouse that's in the house, your interest rate is going to be 8% and uh, you're going to have a $5,000 fee you know, to set it up. But part of the divorce things is that person sets it up. So after two years, they've got a good track record. They would go to a traditional bank and get a lower interest. So there's a turnover. And again, the risk for that, and again, people can look these up. It's Mortgage Incorporated or MIC, Mix, if you want to call them that. You're basically, downside is you need the house to sell for less than 50%. Yeah. And you need to have everybody in the 200 mortgages in the investment pot not pay. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, we call that in the US, there's a term called non recourse loans. Okay. Yeah, which basically says, you know, it is so unlikely that the value of the property, if analyzed properly upfront, would ever be below 50%. Right? right. So if everybody doesn't pay, which is already in itself <laughs> kind of unlikely, but if you were to go there to say, okay, well, then I have the asset, can I get 50% of the original asset value? And the answer should always be yes, if you do your, yeah. do your analysis properly. So that is basically from that perspective, no risk of real total loss. Or, or yeah, so the, you know, the, the, the likelihood. So you're basically, if you go back to asset dedication model, you've got a bucket that's a small bucket of fixed, you know, uh, GICs or, you know, some sort of fixed income for the moment when you need income and your stocks are down, or you've got something going on with the, you know, the income in your middle bucket, which is your real estate or lending is not enough to pay for your living expenses. And then the third bucket, so in the, in the million example, we did 300,000 into GICs, we did 400,000 into piece of property, and we got 300,000 that we're going to go into some sort of stock bucket. Okay. If this person is older, I wouldn't probably introduce what we call like a high risk bucket where you're going to maybe do crypto, gold, penny stocks. And again, that on mass, you know, for my 18 years of witnessing, you know, I have 51 high net worth families, not one of them got high net worth by doing any of those things in a fancy way. They all usually had a business and that was, you know, they focused their energy into it. They either bought real estate. Common in our region is a lot of businesses would say five to 
30 employee type kind of businesses. Right. Yeah, yeah. And they bought the plant or they bought the land that their business was on and rented it off themselves. So that's a common sort of trend. So again, in the stocks, we talked about investing in a stock that's part of your circle of competence. And you know, if you are a business owner, making sure you ask the questions of your investment advisor, are these investments in line with what I believe? Because a lot of times I'll get statements and clients will say, hey, I've got investments. Can you review this? And I'll ask them. I'll say, hey, we reviewed it. You know, maybe it lacks a bit of strategy, but there's there's a lot of different stuff. And so how did you run your own business? And they'll say, well, no, I you know, ran it like this. And, you know, and so when people move from running a business to investing, somehow there can be a disconnect sometimes. And it usually not the fault of the advisor, because, you know, they might have a good relationship, which is the cornerstone of any investment relationship. It's got to be a good relationship. But the offerings of these certain advisors, you know, can sometimes disconnect from how the business owner ran their own business. So what happens is in a good year, nothing happens. Everyone's happy. In a bad year, you have sort of this like, well, what do you invest me in? Well, we we had this stock for growth. Well, it's like, well, I don't understand it. So why is it in there? So then you've got friction. And so again, in good markets, nothing happens. In bad markets, that's when relationships can be tested. Yeah, absolutely. I I think there's also, you mentioned relationships. uh, And I think that's one of the fundamental differences for anybody who is supporting their investors more in a like a family office kind of approach versus a traditional financial advisor approach. Because for me, even though a lot of them don't want to admit it if you were to do only vanguard and go to an extreme example right like if you only go to the different vanguard offerings and you're in a financial advisor you can apply for food stamps because there is no management (laughs) fee in vanguard right it's basically an investor owned community and advisors can say here's the code for the fund or you can give me the money and i put it in for you but they don't get anything for it so yeah anybody who says i'm an advisor and i'm not looking to some extent for my own survival or my own income and have have to basically balance the best investment for you, Mr. and Mrs. Investor, versus the best situation for me to survive, I think is way different than any kind of family office approach where you say, okay, up to 2 million, you pay me 3%, up to 10 million, you pay me 1.5%, up to 50 million, you pay me 0.75. It's all clear. Everybody knows about it. Then you don't have to worry about, am I getting paid? And you can really focus on what is the goal of the investor. At least that's my interpretation. And there's a financial advisor who somehow wants to weasel themselves out of admitting that they can only make money if they put the money in certain investments that pay them. Yes, that's supposed to also pay the investor, but there's a component of paying them too. And it's just, in my opinion, a very, very severe conflict of interest that the powers that are out there in the financial industry constantly trying to deny exists. And in real estate, it's basically pretty easy, right? If you work with an agent, you know the agent fee is between 5 and 6% unless you use some of these more software-based things. And if you only need one side, then you pay between 2 and 3%. Nobody is hiding it. It's very clear. If you close on yeah. something, you get literally... 100 pages with disclosures where every fee for title fee and registration fee and county fee and everything is disclosed to you. So you see it, right? So the thing that I find quite interesting when you say, you know, you're you're breaking it into these different risk situations is to kind of come full circle in our conversation today, when we are now also wanting to take into consideration kind of like the macroeconomic environment, right? Where we have to say, okay, are all the rumors wrong? Or is there some sort of Western world recession or at least North American recession coming our way? Because if you purely look at this at the indices right now and at the employment numbers, you would say, what the hell are these people talking about, right? But if I'm saying, okay, well, most people don't come to Dustin or to me for that matter, they never come with the money. They come with, you know, how can I generate a cash flowing um, portfolio that gets me to the time freedom point. But regardless, when you just purely look at the numbers and you say, I, I read what people that are respectable, you know, like people might not like Jamie Dimon, but the guy is really, really into this stuff and knows its stuff and has most of the time been right. If you read that or Stan Drunkenmiller is more down your lane and, and you hear what he's saying, you know. But or- they're one or two guys, Axel. That's the problem. They're like, as uh, much as they could say the best thing, they're, they're so 
they're so small in sort of unless you know they, they start getting a big movement and not specifically with those guys i'm talking yeah, no, about i mean what i'm talking about is i hear the drumbeat of the economic situation is probably going to get worse before it gets better that's kind of like humans always want to say that though it's always been that way uh i may i have to say i can't really quite agree to this but this might be because i'm originally from germany and when i grew up there was what they called the european economic wonder which was was basically trying to find a new way to apply economics which they called social economics which meant we want to have a balance between what the government is basically providing to the citizens and how much we're supporting business to be successful because before it was either socialism or capitalism basically and they wanted to find a way in the middle and basically from when i was born for the first 30 years of my life that generated unbelievable growth not straight line also <clears throat> not exponential but when you look at where they started and where they got within the first 30 years of my life and there was ev it was evidence based it wasn't just rumors or like today on youtube or what everybody has their opinion in you know mainstream media you have to wonder is that say, journalism or is that just opinionism you know so but the, the facts are the facts, right? Especially publicly traded companies report their stuff every three months. So you can look at what has actually happened. And I think there is a significant disconnect of what even very highly respectable people in the financial uh, industry say is, you know, likely and what we're actually seeing. And I'm kind of a little confused if the traditional models of economics don't apply anymore or what's actually happening. Uh, I'm with you because <laughs> it's out of our control, really. So I think what you need to ask is, three, you know, there's three things. Is, is your objective to protect what you have? Is your objective to find uh, opportunity, like a, you want to find an opportunity? Or is your objective to have a good, you know, have a good life. And so in, you know, in those three things, it's like, well, if it's protecting what you got, then clamp down, get fixed and get your GICs and just, I made a decision that I can't handle the market. I can't handle the, you know, the hyper trading models and the this and that. It's like, I can't handle that. And the manipulation from polit political things. If it's growth, well then, you know, that that's a different thing, but that's a different mindset than what I hear sort of you saying. Because what I hear is sort of, I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be wrong and put my wealth at jeopardy because I think there, you know, I'm speculating that there is a big thing happening or there's a potential loss thing happening. Am yeah, I right? I, yeah, I, I would rather say the real determining factor in my view when people ask me that question is turn out the noise and ask yourself, like you have the BAM, we have the BHAC. It's the big, hairy, audacious goal. Yeah. Right. Where where we say, okay, what is your big, hairy, audacious goal? And what are the steps that get you closer to that? So if you say, okay, my big, hairy, audacious goal is in eight to 10 years to make enough cash flow with an ever growing asset portfolio that I can pay for everything and don't have to worry, which is a level below where your high net worth people uh, live, but doable for regular people in a, in a regular employment life, then your horizon, your time horizon from the get-go is different. If it's eight to 10 years, in some cases, 15 years or something like that, then all the stuff where I'm saying tune it out is short-term noise. It's the same thing like you see the sign with a lot of lights. You know what the sign says? No. It says casino. <laughs> and when you go through the door of that building that says casino, you have all this ding dong stuff going on left and right. And everybody is pulling the levers and doing all kinds of things for the short term immediate gratification, which has typically nothing to do with your B hack. Right? Yeah. So if you can say, OK, I first become very clear. What's my purpose? What's my goal? What's my big, hairy, audacious goal? And what have I decided the strategy to be to get there? What's the mix? Right? Like I am, for example, saying, you know, 70 percent real estate, 10 percent is in gold, silver, that kind of stuff, a little bit of, of crypto, a little bit of stocks. That's kind of the yeah. and, and then I have a time horizon. And as long as that hasn't changed, it's I can see all these players in the casino going crazy when it goes up and down. And every once in a while, somebody wins and they have this big fanfare and stuff. And then they lose it again because the casino says, no, that wasn't right. And you don't get the money, even though you got the number on that little machine. And what I couldn't care less. Right. So that's for me, you know, also in the context of are we going to have this recession? Will it be a soft landing, a medium landing, a hard landing? And I'm an aviator. 
uh, you know, from the Air Force time. So my answer, and then <laughs> and turn it back over to you, Dustin, is... Any, no, I appreciate this. Any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. That's what we said in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the punchline of the of the podcast. My I so going along the same lines and I appreciate you sort of sharing the the asset sort of distribution you have cuz for it to get so bad that it's you know we're in real trouble. It's the same as sort of saying, well what if the government's so far in trouble that they just say people don't own land anymore. It, like the what if speculation kind of treadmill. So you know, COVID kind of was very hard on all of our psyches of like, anything's possible. And, you know, it's, we've kind of now I'm seeing the trend of people starting to make decisions again and starting to like get some momentum, which is great because we all got paralyzed. It was like, oh, well, this might happen. And what if this might happen? And we're all on our phones and we're just scrolling, scrolling, oh, and just ping, 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 ping. And so I I think, you know, to your point, it just kind of one of the points you'd said is like, if the high net worth space, they're not insulated either. You know, if, if the whole world came crashing down and all these stocks that we own went to zero, well, we're all everyone's in the same playing field so then it's like the world would be so different that i don't think that we would be worried about i got to get my rent up on unit four in that bill you know it's just like all our worries would change yeah that's that's right although and that is maybe when you and i come together for another podcast recording (laughs) there is and i want to put that as a teaser also to our audience is i highly highly recommend to start having if you don't have it already i had it because i'm like i said originally from europe and and then came to the us 30 years ago and always had this international interest but if you look around there are a little more than 190 countries in the world and about 25 or so are considered western world and when we talk about like you just said dustin when the world really goes down the drain kind of thing well we're really only talking about those 25 countries right and more and more there is a development that i see on the big picture where we were trying for half of my life to come together you know kind of unite have you know global trade in in united nations and all that kind of stuff and we seem to have gotten to the peak of that around 2017 and now we're going in the opposite direction but but also that means there's like a lot of people don't realize there's a billion people literally and growing rapidly in africa alone right there is like four billion people in asia alone right there's more than a billion and a half now in india alone so when we say the whole world, we're really only talking about like one ninth, maybe one eighth of the world. That's kind of like the kind of world that we can imagine and that we are familiar with and that uses like swift systems and dollars and trades the way we know and place in the economic traditions that we're familiar with. So there's a lot of stuff going on. That's also, you mentioned earlier, diversification, right? Why would I want to have 10% in gold and silver? It doesn't have to get catastrophic, but like just you see this probably in the news as well. If the US can't figure out how to extend their debt ceiling, some pretty nasty stuff is probably going to happen to the dollar. Now, do I believe that they won't? No, they will. But just getting close to the verge now for the second time in 10 years tells the rest of the world these other 199 190 or so countries hmm, should we really cons- completely depend on it or like what happened you know i'm against the war with russia and ukraine as well but there's never been a case where a group of countries just said hey we're violating every rule that we ever signed up to and you don't get your bank accounts you don't get your assets you don't get to trade you don't get to use swift anymore and believe that the rest of these other 170 or so countries are just sitting there and saying hmm if i were to miss behave what would happen to me right yeah. and and then sit there and say oh no it's not going to happen i don't have to worry no they all worry right so these things they're not short-term things they're not happening in in a 90-day cycle for quarterly earnings or stuff like that and they might not necessarily show up in the stock market but for us when you say okay i'm not just doing this for myself i'm not just doing this for retirement i'm also doing this for my daughter and for the next generation after that and i believe that high net worth individuals have a little bit of a legacy thinking as well 100 percent. you know then then you need to look bigger picture and longer term and there are things happening that i think people should be aware of right no you've raised some great points today for sure now before we we go too far down another tangent i have two questions <laughs> always at the end of each podcast dustin so the first one is if you could meet anybody past or present who would it be and why 
The first person that popped into my mind was Ray Dalio, actually. Uh, I think he's, uh, you know, if it was a younger me, I'd probably would have said Buffett because I was a big Buffett sort of reader when I was younger. But Ray Dalio now, I read, you know, a book to my kids called Principles for Success for Kids. Uh, And, you know, he he read, he just wrote some spicy stuff about the changing of the world order and along the same lines of what you're just talking about. But I think he does have a lot of uh, proven sort of theory and, and, uh, and, and many decades of experience that uh, I, I would love to uh, to have a chat with him just to okay. have a visit. Yeah, I, I would come along on that one. I've read <laughs> I've read those books that you mentioned. If you want to read uh, one, maybe it's an interesting one that I just finished uh, reading. Is the title is "Has China Won?" It's not from Ray Dalio, but it's in the okay. same in the same realm from a guy that was um, a high ranking official in United Nations stuff like that from Singapore mm. and. I was fascinated. And, it, you know, if you like Ray Dalio and Warren Buffett stuff and so forth, then you will probably like that one as well. Um, now, I'm also here for our audience. If anybody has started a book list and <laughs> listening to us, <laughs> I'm also at, at the point where we are in, in the cycle, I would say, because Ray is talking a lot about that, you would also probably or should read The Fourth Turning. Okay. Ray Dalio's, you know, the, the New World Order or the Changing World Order is much more current. But to put it in perspective, especially when where he talks about the cycles the fourth turning makes a lot of sense that was written when you started uh, in in your career it's a bitcoin book isn't it or no the, a... fourth turn, the fourth turning is an economics book looking at what have been the really long cycle developments and and the cycle and the fourth turning is defined between 80 and 110 years about round about and it goes back for i think either 500 or 700 years or so forth so not just to say i think there are cycles but it goes to in to say, okay, let's look at what has happened in history all the way to basically the year 2000 in 100 year or thereabouts increments. And I don't want to go too deep, but it's really interesting that the economic cycle at a 100 year stretch behaves pretty much like the seasons throughout the year. Mm. And I thought that was fascinating. And then when I, uh, you, like you mentioned, when Ray came out, Ray Dio came out with his book, I was like, oh, wow, that's almost like a second edition. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, cool. And then the last question is, if you had a time machine, you can go forward, backward, anywhere you want. You're n- not allowed to change the space-time continuum, but where would you go and why? Being a big goal setter, I would have thought I would have been like, go out to the future and sort of like see materialization of goals. But after I read your question, I probably would go back to when, you know, more like industrial revolution of like, you know, when they they were coming out with some big stuff, like we've come out with some big stuff lately, but it hasn't really been, you know, it's been technology, but it hasn't been the equivalent of some of those things that they invented, moving people around and, and printing press and all that kind of stuff and communication tools like that would have been a pretty fun time. I think I wouldn't have loved having to wear three piece suit, you know, like you see people working on the railway three piece suits, like, oh my goodness. But yeah. So that industrial revolution time would have been pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I would also come along with you because I would would want to find out because most people don't realize when you go to the development of cars, almost, almost at the same time, two German guys were working on what we call combustion engines, you know, Daimler and Benz. Right. Um, But there were other people that were working on electric propulsion. Nikola Tesla or electric cars? Tesla was more in engineering kind of stuff. No, but there were literally electric cars. The the issue, one of the issues which we're still facing today was that how to make batteries good enough to last, right? And I read a little bit about it. What I find fascinating is, yeah, that's, that makes kind of sense. And especially in light of how mainstream is still struggling today with it. But on the other hand, if you look at how the combustion engine has evolved over the last hundred years and what they had when they started, just imagine for a second, it would have been not the combustion engine, but the electrical one. Wouldn't we have had like massive technological advancements over yeah. here as well? So I have a suspicion. I don't know. I haven't read about it or stuff, but I have a suspicion that there was maybe some politics involved. Why the oil-based propulsion was ultimately chosen? Because if it, you are an engineer, you know that the electrical propulsion is way more efficient than oil-based. Way more efficient, like three to four times as efficient. So you know, purely on technology, it should have been electric. Yeah, but, actually, no. you're you're touching some hot topics today. That's awesome. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. You know, like when we go together to the industrial 
revolution time, I think that would be interesting to ask these guys, you know. Yeah, what happened here? Yeah, especially, I mean, one last little drop tidbit I want to drop for, for my audience and hopefully yours if you share the podcast is I want people to really, there's a great series uh, of YouTube videos by a guy named Tony Sieber. Okay. And it's actually, I always say Sieber, but the last name I think is spelled S-A-B-A. And these guys do like amazing research and they're trying not so much to dwell on what happened in the past, but what is most likely going to happen in the future based on technology that we have available today. But what they're applying is basically, okay, and I didn't know this. I was totally blown away. Did you know that we went from horse carriages to combustion engine cars in 15? years no in the first presentation that tony shows he shows an image of broadway okay and the picture shows one of the very first cars and everything else is horse carriages and then the next picture is 15 years later and there's one horse carriage and everything else is cars yeah and it would never i mean that's such a powerful image right and it never occurred to me that that revolution took 15 years from that's people true. saying this thing is obviously better and then everybody adopted it right and i'm like how many times times has that kind of happened right like i mean think about right how long did it take from getting dvds sent in the mail to streaming <laughs> yeah, you know you know 2007 the first iphone came out nowadays you can't find even little kids without a phone yeah right and that's like what do we have that's 18 years or something like that you know 15 16 years something it's amazing these 15 year how long something is so revolutionary or how short I should say it took, right? Yeah. So Tony, Tony is using these kind of things. And I give you one little thing for all, all of you guys listening and for you, Dustin. He says the transition from combustion to electric is not a caterpillar with wings. It's a caterpillar transitioning into a butterfly. Right. And obviously also says most of the traditional car companies still think they can put wings on a caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, just to finish off your Tesla thing, I do think that company uh, has some serious, it isn't a car company. There's something bigger there. Um, and I did say, you know, about the cult thing, I'm a, I'm a CrossFit, avid CrossFitter. And, you know, part of the thing is it is a community and you do start to bind to it in whatever way. And it does help you, you know, in that case, it's fitness for me. In your case, it's like when you're around other people that believe, then you have a great energy energy around it and it helps you sort of you know stay stay the course and and see your investment through and you know you know if you're managing your risk i have to say it's like you'll you'll grow it if it's concentrated and uh you know for someone who's looking to preserve maybe you allocate an amount to that that you if it goes to zero it doesn't really affect you it's going to piss you off but it's it's not a you know it doesn't have to be tesla it could be whatever your thing is that's yeah yeah absolutely and and see for me this community point i think you're making an excellent and a really really important point this community aspect leads to um, i would say an evolution of what used to be traditionally good enough when you gave assuming you had enough money you gave it to somebody to make more out of what you already made like we started our conversation you had to have trust in the person to be able to do this and that's obviously in how you choose who you want to do that with in this community-based approach you also have to have trust but you have much more opportunity also nowadays based on the technology available to verify right when you have a hundred different youtube channels and everybody is looking at every little thing every day literally like and you can do this for tesla for palantir and you you name it anything especially technology or growth oriented apple or you know anything they have communities like you just said and these people purely out of the need to have something to report all the time they really like scour every little thing that is physically possibly available any rumor any article anything so you can trust but you also have amazing ways to verify if what you're trying to trust into is based in something and i think yeah. that makes it way more powerful and yes uh, when it gets to a cult kind of thing then you know it has kind of religious undertones and that's always dangerous but as long as it is factual logical you know yeah. data-based and stuff like that then the broader the foundation you can have in any approach, I think the better. And so, yeah, you made a great point about, you know, if it's a community of like-minded people with similar goals, they just want to understand. 
they don't want to just trust, they want to understand so they can verify it. I think that is a very powerful approach to investing. And it gives you happiness, which is wealth in, in a way. So part of your ethos is that, and it makes you feel good. And it's part of, and again, I, I think we've touched on a lot of stuff and kind of talked about this already, but that's your life is better with that in your life. You don't like seeing it go down, but you understand it. And it like someone who plays golf five times a week, or it's, it's a thing that you enjoy. And it's also constructive to diversifying your real estate. Yeah, absolutely. And it happens in a market, right? It doesn't happen in a vacuum. So if people say, okay, that was a great conversation. I really like what I hear from Dustin. How can they get in touch with you? Sure. So we have a website called service. That's S-E-R-V-I-S-S wealth.com. Number of resources on there. I also have a podcast called The Picture of Wealth. You can find it on the Service Wealth website or just simply by searching the picture of wealth. And I'm on all the social Instagram, LinkedIn channels. Okay, Dustin, that was wonderful and a lot of really important nuggets. I think we had a great conversation. So I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank and you, Axel. And we can do it again sometime. For sure. All right. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Ideal Investor Show. More info and the links we mentioned during the show are in the show notes or you can go to our website at idealwealthgrower.com and sign up for the Apple Podcast link. And if you like to talk to me, sign up for a strategy call. Hopefully you want to share what you learned with your network and bring more people in. We are really eager to hear your comments. And until next time, be well, stay safe and ciao. Will it be a soft landing, a medium landing, a hard landing, and I'm an aviator, you know, from the Air Force time. So my answer, at any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. That's what we said in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the punchline of the, of the podcast.